everybody. This is John here. This is Paul. George. And Ringo. And we're very happy to be on your program once again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Beatles News Briefs, your home for all the news you need to know and the best views from the Beatle world. I'm your host, Steve Marinucci, and we have a very, very special show for you today. This is being taped on August 8th, the 50th anniversary of the Beatles photo shoot on Abbey Road. And here's a little of what happened there today. And the Beatles celebrated the anniversary by announcing the forthcoming release of a box set with outtakes and a remastered album. We're going to talk about all of that with exclusive interviews with three very special guests who have written new books on the album and the latter years of the Beatles. Our guests are Ken McNabb, whose book is called And in the End, The Last Days of the Beatles, in which he looks at events surrounding the end of the group. Kenneth Womack, whose book coming in October is called Solid State, The Story of Abbey Road and the End of the Beatles, which looks at the writing, recording, and mixing and reception of Abbey Road. And Bruce Spicer, whose forthcoming book is called The Beatles Get Back to Abbey Road, a look at the album from a historical and a fan perspective. Our interviews with the, with the authors were all taped on Wednesday, a day before the announcement was made, and we were able to discuss the new set with all of them. Ken McNabb discusses his book and some of the rare interviews he obtained in his research, while Ken, Kenneth Womack talks about the significance of the album and the new mixes. And Bruce Spicer's interview was from London, where Bruce, who has heard the new mixes, gives us an exclusive preview about what Giles Martin has done. But let's first talk about what was announced today. The news was topped by the announcement of the Super Deluxe set that has four discs, three CDs, one of which is the new 2019 mix by Giles Martin and Sam O'Kell, and two discs of unreleased sessions and outtakes, and a Blu-ray with high-res mixes uh, that have uh, Dolby Atmos 5.1 and the 2019 stereo mix on them. There's also a deluxe CD and vinyl sets and double and single CD sets. The deluxe vinyl has three discs with the new mix on one disc on two sides and the sessions on two discs on four sides. The deluxe two CD set has the new mix and one disc of sessions and then there's the obviously the single CD. EMI posted five videos on YouTube. Three of them are of something. One has the new 2019 mix and two of them have outtakes, one of one of which is a demo that's been out before on bootleg, but not as in good quality as it is here. And then an instrumental strings-only version that is kind of like what they did with Within You, Without You, with the instrumental backing. The instrumental of something is absolutely gorgeous, especially under headphones. The new 2019 some, something mix really resonated for us near the end with the keyboard boards that you can hear boosted. The videos with the medleys are basically the same, and don't give it a whole lot of preview, though the bass on Come Together seemed to be more prominent, what you could hear of it. And Octopus's Garden seems to boost Ringo's voice and the instrumental backing, and all have more clarity. And I would also guess yeah, what little you can hear is that the drums are boosted, because that's one thing that Ringo mentioned in his interview recently that he really liked. So... We're going to start our interviews with Ken McNabb, who we talked to from Scotland, and we first asked him about the Beatles and their history with Scotland. I actually am going to start with a question that that kind of doesn't relate so much to the and, and in the end book, but it relates more to Scotland, because obviously that's where you are, is that... Um, that Scotland pay, played such a big role in the Beatles' history that American fans uh, probably aren't familiar with. Um, what are some of the things, just off the top, that that Scotland? I, I know I was just reading in the book, by the way, about the the the, cra- the John and Yoko crash. So I know that that's part of it too. But what were some of the other things? Well, some of the, some of the other things that perhaps uh, fans over on your side of the pond don't. Uh, don't I'm not aware of is that John Lennon when he was a teenager 
spent an awful lot of time in a, a small village in the Scottish Highlands called Durness, which mm-hmm. is right at the top of Scotland, very remote. And he would he would go up there with his cousin Stan Parks, and and they would spend several weeks up there during the school summer holidays. And it was a great bonding experience, not only for the two boys, but for John, it was quite a, a liberating experience because, you know, Liverpool being a, a post-Second War industrial city with a lot of, you know, pollution, fumes, traffic. Um, and, of course, somewhere like Dun- Duness, Steve, is, is a complete antithesis of that, you know, because it's remote, it's open countryside, and it's right on, uh, right overlooking the ocean, actually. And mm-hmm. it's a lovely spot. It's absolutely brilliant. But, uh, you know, for John, this would have been, you know, something radically different than the life that he was used to in Liverpool with Mimi. So mm-hmm. it was it, it was really the ultimate great escape. And that's where John's relationship or love affair with Scotland begins in Durness, in the Scottish Highlands. And the interesting thing for, for, from my point of view is that when the Beatles were starting out, one of the very first tours that they did, which is even which even predates Hamburg, is that they went on a tour of Scotland. And it was only like six, seven, eight gigs or so in very remote towns, uh, far off the beaten track, if you like. Um, and they were there with a singer called Johnny Gentle. Right. And of course, the primary role, as I'm sure some people might be aware of, is that they were the backing group for Johnny Gentle, who was a sort of Liverpool crooner, you know, at the lower end of the pop charts, nothing special. But for the Beatles, of course, this the idea of going on any kind of tour at that time when you're very young and ambitious is, is very attractive. So it is quite interesting, I think, that, you know, the, the first place, one of the first places they went to as a band, as a touring band, was in Scotland. We then asked uh, Ken McNabb how his book came together and he gave us some details. I think it probably took the best part of three years. I mean, I wasn't that I wasn't that sure whether you know the world needed another Beatles book, to be honest. Um, and I had done one about ten years ago, the, the Scotland one, which I was quite happy with. But mm-hmm. and I, and I had done some other things in between, like sports books. I mean, I mean, I'm a sports journalist, so. But you know, I, I, when 1969 was coming up, I began to sort of ruminate and think, well, could you do it? Is there is is there enough material to justify it? And and can you bring something new to the table? I think that was important. Can you bring something new to the table? Right. And so the idea of then maybe going on a month by month a month by month basis and looking at the events that happened month by month and then trying to provide some kind of narrative, some kind of tapestry. Uh, and you know, I quite like diary books, Steve, where you can dip in and out of different areas. You know, say for example political diaries or Michael Palin's diaries where you don't have to read the whole thing but you can dip in and out the bits you like mm-hmm. and um, so the idea then anyway was to try and you know you know build up this tapestry if you like going from month to month and of course when you look at it as I'm sure you'll be only too aware is when you look at things on a month by month basis I mean what what the, the the amount of things that they used to cram into their lives in those days is unbelievable I mean, I always mm-hmm. think the time in the 60s, Steve, you know, is, it takes on some kind of elast- elasticity. You know, right. it's, not, it's not so much that time stands still, but it just seemed to take longer to happen. You know, it's like it has an elastic element to it. And it just seems to, you know, when you look at the amount of work that not just the Beatles, but lots of other bands managed to do in such a, 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 small, a m- small amount of time, if you like, a constricted amount of time is incredible. Um, so, you know, I liked, I, eventually I just needed to convince myself that maybe, just maybe, that there might be enough there. But I didn't want to do a sort of cut and paste job. I wanted to be able to go in and, and, you know, try and, as I say, bring something new to it. And I think context was everything. So I went back and tried as best as I could to interview as many people who were in the band's orbit at the time, those who are still here, of course. Mm-hmm. And um, because you know yourself, you know, stories become myths. And myths become legends. Right. And I think it was important to try and dial down into the story to try and separate fact from fiction. You become a bit of a rock and roll detective and you have to throw all the evidence that you've read and all the books and sift through the clues and then try and get to what should be the kernel of the truth. Very difficult, as you'll know. Sure. 
who were some of the people that you got on the record for the first time? Well, I'm just trying to remember the guy's name. There was one of the um, one of the photographers that let it be who was quite helpful, um, you know, because he didn't he didn't have an axe to grind, um, and so he was quite helpful at being able to shine a light on the specifics of arguments and tensions, atmospherics, moods. Um, one of the things, one of the things we're, we're talking today about, just on the anniversary of the Abbey Road cover being uh, shot. But one of the things I was quite proud of was to track down uh, a couple of guys who are actually in the picture. You obviously know the picture, but down in the left-hand corner, there mm-hmm. are there are three guys wearing white overalls, and they they were painters and decorators who just happened to be working at Abbey Road that day. Hmm. So I managed to track one of these guys down and, and he was fascinating simply from the point of view about being able to, you know, talk about the, the human element of being in the same room as the Beatles. You know, he would sit down in the EMI canteen and have a sandwich and a cup of tea and they would be sitting at the next table and they would have casual everyday conversations. Um, but, you know, there were guys like uh, like uh, uh, John Kosh, for example, Dan Richter. Um, you know, guys like that who, you know, were involved with the principles, if you like, who were able to give you some kind of honest perspective on what actually took place, rather than relying on second, third, or even fourth-hand testimonies. Mm-hmm. So, talk to. Did I read this morning that you also talked to Ian McMillan about the well, cover? I talked, to, I talked to Ian McMillan before he died. Right. Um, um, it was unfortunate. Actually, I spoke to him very briefly. But I knew he was ill, but I didn't realise how ill he was. Um, so I was due to go up to a, a place in, in Scotland called Carnoustie to interview him, and and his health just deteriorated really quickly. So it was unfortunate. But, uh, you know, I spoke to him very briefly on the phone, and even in that brief conversation, you could tell that he was a, a, a very nice man, very humble. You know, his initial his initial reaction was that he really didn't, want to talk about the image because he didn't really think it was that important. He didn't even think it was his best picture. Mm-hmm. You know, and he felt too much fuss had been made of it. But uh, I think that just uh, reflects the kind of humble guy that he was really, you know. Right, right. The The beginning of the book, uh, you talk about the Beatles as being really fractured and, and you are really honest in, in terms of what was happening with them at the time. How in the how in the middle of all the turmoil that was going on did they manage to record Let It Be in Abbey Road? What what kept them together? Well, you know, that's a very interesting question. I mean, I think they had the I think one of the great talents that they had was that they were able to compartmentalize all the different things that were happening in their lives. I mean, by the time they get to by the time they get to record Let It Be, you must remember that it's only a matter of weeks, maybe ten weeks or so since the end of the White, white album sessions, which were in themselves extremely grueling and took a terrible toll on them. And then, of course, Paul being Paul, being the band's cheerleader and and a workaholic, drags them back into the studio, um, you know, under duress in the first week in January. And I think history will tell you now that if you look through, if you look at things through the prism of 50 years, they were simply professionally and personally exhausted. Mm-hmm. They had just reached the bottom of the road um, and, you know, they, they they maybe had run out of material, but I think they were just fed up. But Paul, you know, this was a band that quickly throughout that month of January was a band in life support, but nobody wanted to be the one to pull the plug on, you know, and, 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 and you know, issue the last rights, as it were. But Paul had this relentless ambition for the band and, and relentless belief that they could still be a band, and perhaps again in hindsight was in denial. But somehow or other, somehow or other, the the it, it, the music drew them back together as a band. That no matter what was going on in their personal lives, that somehow or other they were able to function together as a band and and draw the best out of each other to remain as a band. Okay. Especially yeah. during Abbey Road, it has to be said. Let it be is miserable. It's absolutely mm-hmm. miserable, and, and there's no way that that anybody can uh, sugarcoat that. The unvarnished truth is that the sessions for Let It Be are miserable. Now, Peter Jackson, and I'm delighted that he's doing it, but you cannot reheat a souffle. 
And if at the end of the day, the sessions are miserable, then you can't change that. You might be able to put a different perspective on it. And they, weren't, they probably weren't all miserable. They probably there were some really very good and strong moments. You only have to listen to the album to realise that, I mean, Let It Be is, is, a, is a hymn to the world and, and remains one of the the great the greatest songs that they ever did. So there are obviously major peaks, but sitting alongside the major peaks are some serious troughs. Right. Did did uh, the did the loose aspect of those sessions though, where they, you know, where they did a lot of jamming and stuff, uh, did that? Do you think there was any benefit to that? Uh, I I agree with you about the about the the problems there, but uh, do you think there was some kind of benefit in the end? Well, it's it's hard to say. I mean, it's almost like the Beatles unplugged, isn't it? You know, I, I quite mm-hmm. like I quite like the, I quite like the concept where you know you're you're seeing them. Uh, you know, as John as John famously put it, with their trousers down. Um, but there are some there are some still some brilliant moments. Um, it perhaps is a bit raggedy, Steve. You know, it's a bit unfocused and a bit undisciplined, um, and 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 there are too many loose ends. I mean, there are some moments where it it, it really does soar. Um, but perhaps the looseness of it all contributed to the fact that you know, I mean, you must remember these are guys who at that point they're they're all still in their twenties. Right. You know, they're young men, and it's inevitable. I mean, if you and I were to go back to our twenties, you know, you're forming different relationships. You mm-hmm. might be getting married. You might have families, um, and it's inevitable that you know you're you're moving away from that high school diaspora, if you like, um, and and that's perhaps has has some part to play in it. But right. setting aside setting aside the fact that the, the sessions were miserable, at the same time you have all the internecine warfare in the background to do with business, uh, to do with Alan Klein, that perhaps it was really just difficult to to come together in the studio in the way that they used to do. We then talked with Ken about his feelings about uh, Abbey Road and the Let It Be albums. And he had some interesting things to say. Take a listen. Do you think that the Peter Jackson film is going to be beneficial in, in terms of, um, you know, putting new clarity on the sessions or, uh, yeah, I mean, putting a new clarity on the sessions or is it just going to be like Let It Be Naked where they're looking to just um, change what everybody thinks about it? Um, well, I, th- I think I think there is a possibility for some clarity there, Steve. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I said earlier on about when you do a project like the one I've just been involved in, I think context is everything. And at the moment, if you look at all the footage that's online, uh, for those of us who can remember barely being able to actually see the original film before it was mothballed, um, and it is an unhappy watching experience. So I think it's only natural to assume that there is footage there. What did they shoot? Is it something like 400 hours that hasn't been seen? I mean, you know, um, even even allowing for uh, Peter Jackson's prodigious output, that's a lot of footage. <laughs> right. Um, and I'm quite sure that he will be able to counterbalance some of the negativity in the original film, um, while at the same time, as I say, you must be aware that they must remember that this was a band, um, you know, not in a very healthy place. Uh, right. But I will be interested to see it. You know, I'm a great fan of Peter Jackson. I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and and I'll be very interested to see it. And you know, for for guys like you and I, we we haven't been able to see this stuff. So, so anything right. new is always welcome, um, think, especially especially when it comes to film. Right. Do you think you'll have enough freedom though to to do to to make it honest, or do you think again? Do you think that it'll be um, basically what they what they kind of are looking for? Well, I hope I hope he gets the room to manoeuvre. I mean, if the Beatles stood for anything, aside from the music, it was that they, they stood for... Un- I mean, John Lennon's honesty was very close to masochism. You know, they, right. they, were, they were very principled. And, and, and I think that all four of them thought that honesty, candour and the truth was very important. So I hope that there's no attempt to try and airbrush certain things out of history. Abbey Road is simply magnificent um, in, in, in its production values, uh, which will be interesting to see um, how Giles Martin, what Giles Martin has done with the reboot and the remix. I'll be very interested to hear that because sonically, I always think Abbey Road is is magnificent. 
Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, it's interesting to note, I, I think, Stephen, you know, we're talking about Abbey Road, um, that I, I think it's a great record. And, and it's like the Beatles' loves, last love letter to the world. It's got some magnificent songs on it. Paul McCartney's I Never Gu- You Never Give Me Your Money is one of these tracks that would never make it on the radio, but is such a brilliant song. Um, when you hear And In The End with the guitar duels, this is the era of, you know, Hendrix, Clapton, Zeppelin mm-hmm. were just Zeppelin were just taking off. And it and, and it just shows the musicality of John, George and Paul as musicians. And and I will defend <laughs> I will defend Ringo Starr to my dying day because on Abbey Road his drumming is simply peerless. It's imperious and it's on it's easily on a par with John Bonham or Keith Moon. Uh, his drumming in Abbey Road is, is off the grid. It's magnificent. But if I have one observation to make, Steve, it would be this. that At that time, and George Harrison's two contributions to Abbey Road, obviously, Here Comes the Sun and Something, stand alone as two of his best songs that he ever, he ever uh, oh, created. Yeah. But when you look at Abbey Road as a whole, Steve, I think, controversially perhaps, I think we could live without Maxwell Silverhammer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think history would be changed if Maxwell's if Maxwell didn't actually uh, wield his silver hammer. There we but, go. But I do think that if if John and Paul and remember the very powerful forces as individuals, very powerful personalities within the band. But I do think that if John and Paul had been able to set aside some of their ego and allow George even more room in the album for some of the material that he had in his bottom drawer, some of the songs that would go on to grace his first solo album, All Things Must Pass, mm-hmm. had, th- had they given George a bit more leeway and included some of the tracks that he was working on on Abbey Road, then I think Abbey Road would have been out of reach as the best album of all time, um, if you consider even some of the tracks that ended up in All Things Must Pass. Right. Uh, and I do think that, you know, and that's not to denigrate the songs that are on it or to denigrate George maybe didn't push hard enough. But you know yourself, some of these songs and all things must pass would have been sensational in Abbey Road. Well, the title song, uh, the title, like he was working on that during during yeah. Abbey Road. And that was that would have been fantastic. I mean, I can that. understand why they didn't fancy it, because if you listen to the lyrics, well, it's pretty obvious what he's talking about when he says mm-hmm. all must pass and I understand that would be difficult but you know there are other examples of songs in the band at that time where there are clearly small digs at various topical things that are taking place but I do think that you know George had two more songs I'm not even convinced about Oh Darling but two more (laughs) songs I think um, would have taken it off again and the interesting thing of course is that in these days of streaming the one Beatles song which is streamed more than any other is not a Lennon McCartney song, but a George Harrison song. Harrison song, Here right. Comes the sun. Here comes the sun, yeah. We'll be right back with Kenneth Womack. And we're back. And here's uh, author Kenneth Womack, who, as you know, has written many scholarly uh, books on the Beatles. And he talks with us about the Beatles and the legacy of the Abbey Road album. Ken is the dean of the Wayne D. McMurray School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Monmouth University, where he also serves as professor professor of English. B. Abbey Road and the and the dissolution of the group. Um, is it? I mean, what do you think a box like this does for for Abbey Road? Oh, I think it's uh, very important because it gives us a window into the making of these extraordinary tracks that have stood the test of time. Mm-hmm. Uh, a new selection of uh, well-produced outtakes um, and alternate tracks would just be a gold mine for Beatles fans uh, and a way for us to appreciate the album in terms of the sheer human creativity and uh, you know, raw sweat and uh, creative energy that went into making this this extraordinary record. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think Do you think the album needs a remix? Um. Oh, I do. I mean, I uh, if it if it receives the treatment that it has so far, 
that we, that we've seen rather with uh, Sergeant Pepper and the White Album. Absolutely, uh, you know the ability to expand the sound palette as Giles Martin had done with those first two records uh, really allowed us uh, a new window into um, all of the extraordinary sounds, musicianship and songwriting that were already there. He typically takes from what I can tell is a very light touch in preparing these mixes. So as not to interrupt the original uh, authorial intentionality Mm-hmm. Um, and because of that, I, I see the, the remixes as, uh, excuse me, yeah, the remixes as simply being another way for us to uh, enjoy these extraordinary recordings. Did you prefer the other? In other words, uh, Pepper over white, or the White Album or White Album over Pepper? Um, gosh, that's a tough question. I mean, I adore them both, but I would give the edge to the White Album. It needed... Uh, I believe more than Sergeant Pepper, it needed the sound palette to be expanded and widened because uh, very often there was a lot of um, layered instrumentation. Uh, you know, take Dear Prudence, for example. Mm-hmm. It's a wonder to listen to that beautiful new remix because um, you hear things you simply never had heard before. Uh, and, and I'm, you know, I don't have to be convinced that if the Beatles had access to that level of technology and they could have presented their sound in a better and more expansive, more defined way, uh, they would have done it. <laughs> right. You know, we're simply benefiting from technology that exists at this part of, in this part of history that simply didn't exist then. And it allows us to hear all of these beautiful, extraordinary things we didn't hear before. That was, you know, that was the first song when I was listening to the, to the tracks after I had gotten them. That was the first song that that uh, I noticed. It was like, you know, I mean, what they had done with with Dear Prudence, and how they had how they had changed all the, I mean, how he had bumped up the the sound quality on all of those that, that on that particular song and all the, like you say, you could there were so many things you could hear that you never heard before with that remix. It was really astounding. Or let's pick on uh, back in the USSR, being able to hear that. Uh... Uh, the version at uh, a slower speed, um, as Giles provided, um, uh, gave us a window into how that song was produced. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The photo shoot for the Abbey Road album has become part as part of the legend as the album itself. I mean, is that the simplicity of the photo shoot was kind of amazing? How much do you think that added to the whole of the album? I, I think every uh, aspect of of that production adds to the mystique of Abbey Road, right? I mean, memorializing the studio and the most important place in the making of their legend, the you know the the literal walking away from the studio for their um, their 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 last music. Uh, it is simply laden with meaning. It's a very powerful uh, symbolic logic about. Uh, the place of the Beatles in our world. So you've got the production of the the album cover, the music, the songwriting is top flight. Of course, the musicianship is never better than it is on Abbey Road. They've arrived in an extraordinary place by then, and uh, the packaging contributes to that too. It, it was it's such a well wrought album in every way you can imagine. Um... How do you, how do you see the last two albums as far as their legacy goes now, um, especially with the the coming of this 50th anniversary Abbey Road set, and obviously what's going to happen next year with Let It Be? But you know, it it all goes to their legend and their mystique. The Beatles, uh, um, while anybody you know with an intellect wishes they could have made more great music, the fact is, uh, and the historical fact is that. Uh, their time had simply run out as far as their ability to continue working with each other. And uh, a great bit of their mystique has much to do with the way they conclude their career, which is very powerful. You know, they, um, I mean, it, they're heroic really to be able to come back from the interpersonal challenges that they had at various moments over those last couple of years and make music of that incredible quality says it all. I mean, uh, you know, not only were they incredible craftsmen and virtuosic musicians, but they also 
had the self-consciousness to realize that what they were doing was important, regardless of how they may have felt about each other at times, that what they were doing was uh, eclipsed their own interpersonal difficulties. And that is uh, that to me is one of the most powerful stories in art, period. Right. When you're able to see that what you're doing is bigger than yourself and bigger than any proclivities you may have. Finally, here's Bruce Spicer, who we talked to from London. But before our interview, here's Bruce on Abbey Road on Thursday being interviewed about the 50th anniversary. My name is Bruce Spicer, and I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana. Can you tell me, um, <coughs> tell me what's special about today? Special about today, 50 years ago, the famous crosswalk picture was taken oh, across mate. Abbey Road. I remember buying the album a little less than 50 years from the David Day it came out in New Orleans and playing it being thoroughly surprised like everyone else with the great endings to sides one and two. And now here's our chat with Bruce. Uh, he first talked about what he was doing in London, then we moved on to the Abbey Road set. Um, one of the things he discusses in our interview is the comments we saw today about uh, not enough uh, outtakes in the new set. Um, so, anyway, uh, here we go. Obviously, the word is broken here about tomorrow. Um, are they? Are you doing stuff tomorrow, or is there stuff today? Yeah. I'm going to go, well, no, I'm going to go by there tomorrow, mm -hmm. which, uh, you know, it's just still tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, they will um, supposedly have a giant Abbey Road backdrop in the car park and allow people to get their picture taken in front of that, as opposed to having a million people get run over by traffic. <laughs> uh, although I imagine a lot of people will do that anyway. Yeah. And then they have that lecture series uh, tomorrow night at 8 o'clock that I'm going to go to. Oh, okay. You're not, you're not doing that? You're just going to it? Just attending it, yeah. Oh, okay. Are, have you been involved with this, with the, with the Abbey Road box at all? Uh. No, no, not a, not big involvement, you know, in that, uh, you know, I do some type of consulting work, but I wouldn't say I was a, a key player in its uh, creation. That so would you, be an overstatement. So you didn't hear any, you haven't heard anything as far as sound? I have. Oh, you have? I have heard, yeah. What, um, yeah, and I, I, and I would say that, you know, if you were pleased with Sgt. Pepper and the White Album, you will be pleased with Abbey Road. How many, how many discs are we talking I um, believe it's going to be a total of uh, three CDs and a Blu-ray. What's the Blu-ray? Is that uh, is that um, is that all audio, or is there going to be some video there? Yeah, it's yeah, it's, it's audio where you've got like you know your your five point one and you know and the stereo remix and you know things of that nature. So the, the nice thing about the Blu-ray is that Blu-ray is really your best audio format now. Um, you know, like for example, when the Sgt. Pepper uh, box set came out, mm -hmm. the only thing I ever used my stereo remix CD was in the car, because at home I have a Blu-ray player, you know, and I'd play it off the Blu-ray disc, the stereo remix, because it was just better sound quality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um... Uh, did they? Do you think they? Uh, did they do anything? differently in terms of the present presentation of the album uh, that they didn't do on the first two? No, I mean, sonically, I think that, you know, Giles continued in the same uh, tradition of modernizing the sound but remaining true to the original mm -hmm. in the sense of, you know, with the idea being that the Beatles in 1966 nearly went to record in Memphis because they wanted more of a bass sound than Abbey Road engineers were able to finally give it to them. Mm -hmm. But the Beatles always loved that bass sound. And, you know, and that, of course, is the modern sound. So obviously the bass comes through more on the, um, you know, the remix uh, than it did in the original mix. And, you know, there's not that much that you can do in the sense that the original mix was, for its day, was incredible. But there are a lot of little tricks that Giles has been using since the Sgt. Pepper, uh, you know, of using ADT to create a stereo image where you couldn't get one. And by that, I mean, uh, for example, um, with uh, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, um, you know, if you take 
the guitar track and you run it left and right, it sounds like it's coming down the center. Uh, so there's no way to get it to sound stereo unless you use artificial double tracking. And by that, what you do is you slightly have the left and right guitar tracks, even though it's the same music, slightly out of sync, which then to the human ear means it's coming out of the left speaker and the right speaker rather than coming down the center of the room. And so, you know, that technique was used effectively on a few songs on the White Album. And, I'll, you know, and once again, it, you know, you, you may hear it again on Abbey Road. So, you know, there are a few things like that. And I think the clarity is also um, improved. So particularly on side one, at least where I noticed it most. And, of course, a song like Because and Here Comes the Sun. Um, you know, the medley, uh, I think it sounded great back then and it still sounds great, but nothing really jumped out at me at, oh, my God, this is so much better. You know, it was just consistently sounded great. It's the only way to describe it. So, uh, you know, I'm really a fan of, um, you know, modernizing the sound but remaining true to it. So, in other words, you're not going to hear, like, in the mix something that was totally buried in and, and, you know, wasn't meant to be heard. On the other hand, on Oh Darling, you know, the background vocals may be more up front than you remember, and that's a good thing. So... (laughs) You know, I think Giles has really done an incredible job. Did they include the um, the long version of Her Majesty? <laughs> that with the you know with the with the with the added uh, guitar strum at the end. Did they put that in? Well, Her Majesty is actually included the way it was originally recorded by Paul, and and I'll actually has all three takes of Her Majesty, I believe, and then the uh, long medley or the huge one, as it was called, is also included which has her majesty you know in the middle of the medley um hmm. which really shows that uh you know paul was absolutely right when he said it doesn't work there and that's why it was removed from the medley but it's 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 kind of fun to hear it in good quality it's been bootleg before right but you know bear in mind that the bootlegs really were very poor quality for that particular track it was taken off of a acetate or whatever and, and didn't sound good at all, but it's nice to get that in clarity. I think that people will find a generous assortment of outtakes and will probably come away wishing there were more, but I think that's always the case if you're a big Beatles fan. It's like, you know, you could have two discs of outtakes with the White Album, you know, and then you go, but but what about that, you know? And I think if you judge the final product for what is included, rather than complaining about something that you thought you couldn't live without, uh, you'll come away very satisfied. You know, sort of like some people say, well, I can't believe on Sgt. Pepper they didn't include Carnival of Light. Well, if you'd heard Carnival of Light, you'd know why it wasn't included. So, mm-hmm. You know, I think that, you know, sometimes, it's, you know, you have to use the better part of discretion on that. So, um, you know, as I've said, overall, I think fans will be very very pleased with uh, with what they had. Does that does that uh, getting back to uh, mystery tracks? Does that also apply to the long version of Helter Skelter? That if people heard it, they they kind of not want to hear it. I, I think so. I mean, you know, you heard of what about a twelve minute version? And mm-hmm. I think that was probably a, that was probably enough. I know it was enough for me. So have you you've just, heard you've uh, heard the whole a, you've heard the whole thing? I think we I've asked you that before. You yeah. Yeah, and it's nothing, nothing special. And Carnival of Light, I've heard, and you know, as somebody aptly said, you know, it's the purpose of putting it out would be so that everybody could waste fifteen minutes of their life. You know, I mean, it's it's just really where it worked was if you were at an event and you were lying, you know, on your back, and they had this great white show, and you were listening to this fifteen minute piece. Um, you know, it, it might have been effective. And maybe what they should have done was, you know, recreated the light show and put it out on Blu-ray or something. But, you know, as a listening experience, it's not a very good one. Okay. Well, so Unlike the Abbey Road album, which is a great listening experience. Which is it, right, right. <laughs> you know, I will have a new book coming out at the end of September to coincide with the 50th anniversary of the album. Right. Released. Let's t- talk about that for a second. Uh, name of the book? Mm-hmm. Name of the book is The Beatles Get Back to Abbey Road, 
which is a bit of a pun in that the book literally covers the Get Back single, The Ballad of John and Yoko and the Abbey Road LP, but it also goes into what 1969 was like for the Beatles. They began the year uh, at Twickenham to rehearse for a TV show concert that never happened, and then they went over to the basement at Apple Studios, played a concert uh, on the roof of Apple. Then they did a session over at Trident, some more at Abbey Road, another at Olympic. So they had this kind of nomadic existence, and then on July 1, they literally get back to where they once belonged, which is Abbey Road Studios with George Martin firmly at the helm, mm -hmm. producing an album. And, uh, you know, the book will be similar to the recent Sgt. Pepper and White album books I did, where it gives an American perspective, you know, going through reviews, how things charted, and, uh, you know, what the press was reporting, and also a British perspective, and then uh, Pierce Hemmingston wrote a Canadian one. I have some guest pieces by Al Sussman and Frank Daniels uh, covering uh, the news at the time and pop culture at the time. And then also um, I have a little bit on the Paul McCartney death rumor uh, that helped uh, launch Abbey Road. Uh, there's a fan recollection section where fans just wrote in their reminiscences, uh, you know, about hearing the album for the first time and the like, and uh, also a section on how things were recorded. Um, and it's it's fun doing the books because one of the challenges is you want to try to get some things new that most people have not really seen before, and there'll be some fun surprise images in the book. Uh, the um, Abbey Road album in the UK actually made its debut not on the BBC radio, but on BBC TV on a show called Friday Night Lineup where they played several of the tracks for the album and had different images, uh, you know, video images, such as a spinning Apple label on a turntable <laughs> for, I think, it because they used the Apollo 11 moon landing, uh, you know, and just different type things like that, something they had, a you know, a dancing girl. And um, for Maxwell Selberhammer, they had this cartoon figure of the Beatles as a barbershop quartet where the heads kind of moved back and forth. And that drawing was actually done by John Lennon, and the book actually has that image in the book of John's drawing, which uh, has not really been seen in print before, and, and so, you know, that was kind of fun to do. It also the sheet music for Golden Slumbers that, you know, Paul had basically seen sheet music of Golden Slumbers, which dates back several hundred years, and it was in a book that came out, I think in the late 1800s, where different poems or songs where they didn't have known music. Uh, they hired composers to write music for it. And it has that image in there, which I don't think has been seen that often, and uh, a few other surprises. So it's, you know, it's always fun to get those surprises uh, in the book. And, uh, you know, I hope people will go to the website, buy it. If they do, I know they'll enjoy it. You know what's really ironic about Abbey Road is the number of prominent magazines or publications that actually diss the album you know their reviewers diss the album there, there's yeah. of course the Ed Ward Rolling Stone one but I was reading today there was one in England too um, it wasn't it wasn't well, just not one, in, not, one in, not one in England here's the interesting thing in England the music press in, in England they had four different music weeklies right and then an industry magazine all five of those gave Abbey Road a really good review. However, the Daily Mirror panned it. The reporter for the Daily Manor, Mirror, her comments were, well, you know, George has these great two songs, and Ringo's Octopus is Guarding is charming, but whatever happened to John and Paul? <laughs> so, And then uh, Tony Palmer, who had written this wonderful review of the White Album, panned it. So you had... You know, the Daily Mirror, the Guardian, and the London Observer, all three of them giving it terrible reviews. And when William Mann reviewed it, and he was a little bit late in reviewing it, and he started off his review saying, if you have allowed uh, other reviews that have basically panned the album to dissuade you from purchasing it, you know, don't think that way. It's a really great album. And William Mann praised it. His biggest criticism, his only real criticism was, that it didn't come packaged with the song lyrics. So it did get panned by most of the British press, is rather that, than the music press. 
is the story true that somebody told me the other day, and I don't remember it, that John Mendelssohn's positive review uh, in Rolling Stone came on Jan Wunner's order after the, the Ed Ward review was printed? Is that true? Yeah, yeah, that is true. Now, we went not printed. Ed Ward was assigned the review, and he wrote the review, and it caused a, a firestorm in Rolling Stone. And so uh, John Mendelssohn was commissioned to write another review, and Mendelssohn's review appeared first. Okay. And it's kind of strange, you know, in print, because you read Mendelssohn and then you read Ed Ward's. I mean, he mocked everything, you know, I mean, even mocked the cover. And he said right at the beginning, you know, you know, you know, well, I don't like it. Uh, he was complaining about the price. It cost a dollar more than other albums. And, uh, you know, even got to the point of saying, well, the, you know, the Beatles uh, were putting out this type of garbage and pricing it so high that nobody would buy it. I mean, you know, it was just really, really a nasty review. And then years later, on one of the anniversaries of the album, he was asked about it, and he said, well, I was a kid who was full of himself, and... You know, no, no, that really isn't right. And, uh, and so he, he was, kind of recanted that review. And he was a relatively, I have to be honest, he was one of the writers who influenced me. And he was a relatively good writer in all other, you know, I mean, that's that's that sticks out yeah. like a sore thumb. He didn't do that type of thing very often. I mean, he was a good, he was a good writer for them. And it's really yeah, kind of a shame. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, yeah, and, you know, and one thing, too, about the Beatles and, you know, and it may have been he just listened to it and he just, you know, he was, he just thought it was ridiculous that it cost a dollar more, listened to it, didn't get it, and just sat down and wrote the review. And there was a reviewer in the UK, primarily reviewed singles, uh, named Penny Valentine. Mm-hmm. And she was one of a couple of people that said, you know, the first time I listened to a Beatles record, I don't particularly, you know, like it, but by the second or third listening, you know, I'm raving about it. And so, you know, it may have been in some of these cases that the reviewers just, you know, played it one time and for whatever reason didn't get it and sat down behind their typewriter and wrote it up. Whereas if they had spent some time with it, you know, they would have realized the brilliance of the album. But, you know, in one of the other aspects, too, is um, that we consider Abbey Road to be one of the most iconic album covers of all time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it wasn't even nominated for a Grammy. That's our show for today. You can catch us on Fab Four Radio, beatles Arama, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please join our Beatles News and Information Group on Facebook for the latest in the Beatles world, and check out our That's What I Want Beatles store page on Facebook for gift ideas for yourself or your favorite people, or where you can find links for both contributing editor Candy Leonard's Beatleness book and my Meet a Monkey Davy Jones ebook. And look for our next show and please subscribe. We'll be looking for you. Till next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying. Be seeing you. that one market fab one thing left to say we'll see you next time <laughs>